Uh, so a while back, I had to um, implement some responsive images. It was an unfortunate task, I thought, um, because the browser support is crazy patchy. Um, al <laughs> almost as bad as web components, I'd say. Um, so I did what I think most developers do when they've been tasked with implementing something they haven't implemented before. I started by taking a survey of the current state of play, did some Googling, checked out Stack Overflow, all those, sorts of, all those sorts of sites and places, and tried to figure out what people were doing, how they were implementing it. Um, not only did I discover that there are no good solutions, um, there also, there's, there's a lot of dissent in, in, in the people, in the groups, between the groups of people trying to implement standards. There's, there's, no, there's no, not even a convergence yet around a particular set of standards. We're getting closer now. This is, keep in mind, this was the research I was doing uh, about a year ago. We're getting closer now, but um, really, there's a lot of stuff missing. And there's a lot of stuff missing um, from the browser, and it still is missing from the browser. So um, I had a quest on my hands, that's for sure. This is the definition of responsive web design that I've been working with for a while. And for such a short and concise statement, there's a lot to unpack in there, right? Um, notice that it doesn't say uh, self-optimize for the screen size that the user's viewing the site on, but it says the features of the hardware and software. And there's a lot more to features than just the screen size. We're getting pretty good at parts of this now, We're sort of in a bit of a halfway house. And you know, media queries uh, is, or this website, media queries, as opposed to the actual things, is kind of a good illustration of that. Where we're getting really good now, I think, at, in general, at changing things like the layout, um, navigational structures, um, you know, changing the font size and, and, and size of icons and those sorts of things to give users a better experience when they're browsing your site on something that's got a small form factor, for example. Um, but, you know, we're by no means there, and, then, and there's a lot more to unpack yet. And uh, res responsive images actually helps highlight a lot of the areas that we're missing and a lot of the stuff that's missing from browsers before we can do really good responsive design. So let's try, before we get started, um, to define what the ideal solution would look like. And there are th I've sort of broken this into three parts. There are sort of three uh, elements, I guess, to what I think the perfect responsive images solution looks like. The first one is that the, the browser should be automatically selecting the source image. And it should use a few different metrics to figure out what the best source is. Uh, there's, a f there's a variety of resolution metrics. So there's the display resolution, the viewport resolution, and the pixel density of the device that's being used. Uh, and there's media features and types as well. So you, know, you might have a really beautiful color-coded infographic, um, but you might want to serve up something a little bit different if someone goes to print it on a black and white printer because your colors all you know, lose their meaning. Um, and finally, browsers should be looking at the quality and the speed of the connection to choose the right source for the image. The second step is that, or well, the second bit we need to fill is that, that specifying sources needs to be sensible. That, you know, there needs to be a sensible way to specify what images are available. And you've got to remember that it's not just developers making this specification, it's uh, content creators as well, and they probably don't have the same technical ability. For the developer's point of view, you know, they want to be able to specify the sources or the, you know, the um, conditions under which a, an image is suitable for display using the same vocabulary and the same uh, definition style as we currently do for media queries. We don't want to reinvent that wheel and have to you know, invent a new syntax and a, and a new vocabulary for describing these things, because we've already got a, a pretty good one in media queries. Another thing is we need to 
make sure that relative units are possible. If the user changes their default font size, we don't want that to break our responsive images solution. So we, when specifying these sorts of breakpoints from, from the first dot point there, you know, we need to be able to do that using relative units. And the third thing about specifying sources is we want to be able to art direct the output. So, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. The final, um, the final bit in, the, in this uh, ultimate solution is that the user should have ultimate control. Uh, they should, at the very minimum, be able to specify default font size and not have that break your, your images on the site. Um, but it gets more interesting that, than that when you think about a few examples like, what if you're, you know, you're on the new LTE um, iPhone 5S on, on the Telstra network, so it's blazing fast, um, but you're also on the Telstra network, so your data cost is through the roof. Um, maybe you want to be able to specify in your browser settings that, actually, I just want the low-res version. I know even if there's a better, better version available, I want the low-res version because it's going to cost me less. So that's sort of, I think, a good description of the overall solution we're looking for. And there's a few standards types looking at trying to implement standards that meet this, this specification, I guess. Um, the main one here is the Responsive Images Community Group, and I highly recommend the website. It's great to have a look around. Um, the two longest standing solutions proposed to this problem are uh, the, a new element to the HTML world called Picture and an extension to the current image element called Source Set. But things are still changing all the time. It's a, it's a really fluid, um, fluid sort of place to be. I just loaded up, I was doing some prep on the talk a couple of days ago, so I loaded up the, the standards again, and lo and behold, everything had changed, so I had to make some modifications. Um, so, well, I had a bit of a quest on my hands, right? I got, I got a, uh, what happens when I go through uh, a new standards document is the first thing, I go through three stages. The first thing is I get really excited about all the new and fabulous things I'm going to be able to do. And then um, I dig into it a bit, start doing some implementation, and I realize that there are actually a whole bunch of really difficult problems that aren't yet solved and still need solutions. And then the inevitable third phase of it is that I find out that, or I remember, that I live in the real world and um, I have users that I actually care about who are still on IE7. Um, so, so let's look at let's look at what we can actually do right now. This is what I like to call the choose your own adventure approach to selecting responsive images technique. And um, every adventure needs a wizard. So this is a wizard. And um, let's get into it. I'll take the adventure. What this wizard does is sort of step through a bunch of the decision points that you'll have to think about if you're looking to implement a rep responsive images solution. And up in the top right-hand corner there, you can see that um, there are 20 solutions that I'm aware of that are varying quality, I might add. Um, and I'm sure there are more, and these are all sorts, sort of variations on a theme. But we'll step through the, the, each of the questions and the decision points. The first thing is extra markup. Most of these techniques use extra markup um, in one shape of, uh, uh, or another. They're either trying to um, uh, they wrap all their stuff in div tags and create their own special classes. Whether you want to be able to, you want to use that type of thing to implement your responsive images is really one of practicality. Are your users, are the content creators capable technically of maintaining that markup? Is your CMS capable of outputting a completely different set of markup for images? Um, do you have time to go and build that into your CMS? Um, and are there, maybe there are accessibility implications as well. And then what happens when the standards actually do kind of consolidate and we have got a proper solution? What are the implications there? Do we have to go back through all the stuff we've already done? Is it in a database somewhere, or can we change this output from the CMS? So there's a few different types of extra markup that could be added. So there's a sub-question here, let's say maybe. Um, the first type used very regularly is, is some extra attributes on the image element. Uh, so either some data attributes or some other sort of thing that's trying to replicate proposals like source set. And 
the techniques that work this way usually also require JavaScript, which is a, a thing we'll get to later. Often, um, some of the solutions use uh, no, source, uh, no script tag. Uh, there's a couple of reasons they do this. The first one is actually what it's meant for, which is to implement a fallback when JavaScript isn't available, which sort of makes sense. But you've still got to wrap every image tag in a no script tag. Is that suitable or not? Um, and a lot of techniques uh, actually that use, use no script use it to avoid unwanted image requests. Uh, some try and implement something that looks like picture. So they'll actually take a bunch of div tags and, and make it look like what the future picture proposal, and maybe they'll give it a class of picture or something, so it's obvious. Maybe this is a case for web components, I don't know. Um, and remember that uh, some of them do markup that's just not going to validate, which is probably OK, um, so long as you've thought about it. Remember, validation is just a tool. Don't let it get in the way of a better user experience. Um, so that's, that's all the markup questions for the moment. And the next big thing is art direction. I would argue that almost every image you encounter on the internet would, could, could benefit from art direction if you're looking at it on a 50-inch LCD or on your mobile phone. Um, and a really important thing to point out here is that crop to the center isn't art direction. Um, and it's really easy to implement crop to the center in, in a bit of code, but that's, that's not what we're talking about here. It usually takes some user input. The next thing is, is it OK to use a solution that requires JavaScript? Personally, I think we're at the point now where people without JavaScript are probably edge cases, although there might be some accessibility implications there. Um, JavaScript should, I think, almost be considered one of, one of the core foundational um, things in the web. You know, you've got HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And if you can do something declaratively in, in HTML or in CSS, then do it de declaratively. But um, JavaScript is, is almost an ever-present thing in the web these days. But if you decide JavaScript is OK, um, is a library dependency OK? If you're not, a, a, a few of these techniques rely on jQuery as a library dependency. And if you're not already using jQuery in your, in your project, um, that's probably not a good idea. You, you probably want to choose a different option. A lot of the techniques also use uh, some kind of server-side component. So this typically takes the form of a HD access file that um, redirects as appropriate, or maybe the server's creating images on the fly because there's been a cookie set with your explicit screen dimensions. And when you send an image request down the pipeline, Java, uh, PHP interrupts it and actually magics up your image at the right resolution. Um, first, there's a couple of really important points here. First of all, if you're not using the technology already that the solution is proposing, do you have time? So can you change the server-side technology you're using, or do you have time to port the solution to your server-side technology? Um, is, it is it even possible? Some people work in an environment where it's not even possible to make these sorts of changes to the content management system. And the other really important consideration, which inexplicably isn't on my slide here, um, is that if you're changing the image on the fly, uh, so you're serving up a different set of images at the same URL, you immediately rule out the possibility of using a content delivery network, which is a huge problem. At least one of the solutions I know about is a third-party service. So you point all image requests, get interrupted by this third-party service, and, and the third-party service takes care of all of it for you. Um, and it sounds amazing, a little too good to be true, and maybe it is. Um, one thing you've got to remember if you're, if you're signing up to a third-party service is that it's not going to cost you now, just now, for implementation costs. It's also going to cost you on into the future. Um, and another thing to remember is that services go down. They will go down eventually. And it might be difficult or impossible to implement a, a reliable fallback if they do. 
So what about uh, loading additional images? You know, the, a big part of the point of responsive imagery is that we're taxing the, the user's resources less. You know, we're not loading up a, additional data that doesn't need to be loaded. We're not loading high-res images for low-res um, devices. Um, if you have to do a separate image request, that kind of defeats part of, the, part of the purpose of that. Even if you're loading the low-res one first and then throwing in the high-res one because they're on a big desktop machine, you know, you're still incurring that extra page weight and that extra load time. And is it OK, really, to conflate um, the idea of a high-res display with a fast internet connection with low bandwidth costs? It's probably not OK. So, you know, if you Thinking of implementing a solution that loads additional images, maybe think a bit harder. Bandwidth testing. A few of the solutions try and implement bandwidth testing. This is, this is the biggest hole in what the browser vendors are giving us at the moment. There's no good way to test bandwidth. As far as I know, there's only one way to do it at the moment, or one way that any of these solutions do it. And um, it's this. They have an asset of a known size on the server. They request it with JavaScript and measure how long it takes to get there. First of all, uh, you want that asset to be as small as possible, right? Because otherwise, it defeats the whole purpose. Uh, if you've got a big asset to do to do this bandwidth testing, you know, uh, what's the point? But the smaller it gets, the less accurate it is. And if it's not very accurate, then what's the point in that? So there's this trade-off between accuracy and, and utility. And the, I don't know that there's a midpoint that actually works. My personal thoughts on this one are that we're probably better off waiting for the browser vendors to give us something good and not worry about browser te our bandwidth testing at this point. So you've uh, taken the adventure, you've gone on the quest, and uh, you've reached the end of the rainbow, and this is your pot of gold. Um, there's a bunch, there's, you know, as I say, there's 20 solutions in here, and if you, uh, if you actually answer the questions like I didn't, um, it'll narrow them down, and you'll get, to, you'll get to ones that match your criteria. And they each have a bit of an a, a explanatory sentence and a, um, a link to the demo, so I encourage you to check it out. Um, by the way, this, uh, this slide thing is available um, on a website. If you look at my Twitter account now, you'll probably find it. Um, and it's also on GitHub. I'm actively uh, soliciting pull requests. If you know of a better solution or um, just want to improve it, go for it. Uh, so, but be aware, you know, this pot of gold, it, it probably has some fool's gold in there as well. There are three things I want to talk about to finish off. They sort of didn't fit anywhere else in the presentation, but I think they're kind of important while we're talking about responsive imagery. First of all, about the fool's gold. Not all of these techniques are equal. Some of them are terrible, in fact. Um, but I've put them in there anyway, just as, as you know, an illustration of things people have proposed. Many of them break the semantic nature of HTML. Um, you know, things like loading blank images into the image source and then replacing it with like a back, you know, background image or something using CSS, that, that, that completely breaks the semantics of, of the web. Um, there's also often a loss of separation. Um, did anybody hear that in terms of aircraft crashes the other day? I, I just heard that on the news and I thought that's the perfect term for this, the, a loss of separation between um, content and style. You know, one of the core tenets of, of CSS really is that we separate content from style, and you know it's really easy to lose that lose that separation, and a lot of these techniques do lose it. And you know, poor page rendering performance. One of the one of the big advantages of modern browsers is that they have this thing called prefetch, so they go off and get the assets real quick before the page has even started being displayed. Right. Um, most of these techniques uh, break that, that you, you, you just can't use that prefetch or pre-render at all anymore. Um, and you know, that hole really needs to be plugged by the browser vendors. But you know, if you're implementing a responsive image or solution, keep that in mind. Is that going to be a problem for your particular use case? The bottom line here, folks, is that the best option will depend on your problem space. And there's a wide variety of different problem spaces. You know, somebody working on uh, 
you know, in a small design studio on small to medium business websites is very different to somebody who's working in a large organization on, a, you know, an enterprise product that has hundreds of thousands of visitors. So, you know, examine your problem space first before you, before you select a solution. I also want to point out that um, the, the, the standards people who are talking about this actively are doing a really good job of presenting it to developers. I really recommend going and checking out responsiveimages.org if you, if you haven't or if you're interested in, in this. Uh, for ex for in, in the scheme of all uh, standards documents I've ever read, these are some of the most accessible and they're actually quite readable. And um, it's really important to point out that there's there's not necessarily a competition between the standards proposals either. It, it certainly felt like that in the early days of this discussion, that you know, source set and picture were competing proposals. And in some ways they are. There's definitely an overlap between some of the proposed standards. Um, but source set and picture achieve two slightly different things, and together they can actually pre prevent, uh, present us with a, uh, you know, a better tool set. So um, they can work in harmony. And the final thing is um, about this avoiding the loss of separation. It can be really easy to think that because we're using the same markup and the same vocabulary to define, uh, define when it's suitable to display a picture, so we're putting media queries, what looks like putting media queries inside a, a, an image element, it can be really easy to think that that means we're defining styles in our content, but that's actually not the case. What, th there's a world of difference here between saying, um, display this image under these conditions, and saying, under these conditions, this image is suitable to be displayed. And those, the, the distinction is fairly nuanced, but it is there. And what you, you should think of this kind of markup in your image tag more as metadata about the content than uh, a style declaration, even though they're using the same vocabulary and using the same syntax. Um, yeah, it's, re it's really important that you don't get that confused, because in, when I first started looking at that, I was, I was really allergic to this kind of syntax, because I thought I was defining style in my content, but that's not the case. Thank you. I'm that guy pretty much everywhere, not just Twitter. <laughs>